Well, hi everyone. Um, so what I'd like to share today is about the, uh, how we do front-end development in Skyscanner um, in general because I, I thought that it's, uh, it might be useful for you to, to learn about um, the things that we're doing and, um, and the problems that we're encountering. Maybe your, your company encounters the same problems like, like ours. Like if, for example, you have about maybe about 100 plus engineers uh, working on the same site and all of a sudden the next thing you know is that you have um, some really messy CSS files, CSS, uh, your JavaScript code, code base has um, so many like uh, functions that have maybe different standards and uh, different frameworks. So what I'd like to share to you today is, um, is mostly just uh, about us, how we do it in Skyscanner. A little bit about me, so I'm, uh, I've, been, I've joined Skyscanner since uh, 2013, and uh, since I joined Skyscanner, I've been um, working with uh, different, different groups, different teams. Every year I change teams, so every year it felt like I, I'm working for a different company. And also every year means that there's a different stage of growth that we, we go through. So there's a different reorg, then we handle different products, then we introduce new products. Um, so here are the different teams that I worked on. Um, GitHub and LinkedIn, uh, I posted it there. So what this talk is. So this talk is about uh, just very high level view of um, how we do front end development in Skyscanner. I'm not going to go through the, the specifics, like uh, for example, how we do. Uh, I, I'm not going to dissect through the code. I don't think uh, I don't think we'll have time for that, and I'm not really the, the best person to to walk you through on that. And um, this is also coming from a perspective of someone who's uh, who don't, doesn't do really front end um, on a day to day basis or on a regular basis. So I'd like to share to you the outline of this uh, this talk. So the the first the first I'd like to share to you the um, story of Skyscatter, uh, the the growth that we've experienced over the years, and uh, with that growth we also have um, it means that the team is growing as well, and we we ended up with distributed teams across different countries, different regions. Um, I'd also like to share with you the, the what what did, what else did we do in order for us to make sure that we uh, keep the business running and also deliver uh, quality products on a regular basis. So uh, the, the things that are out outlined from uh, nailing the basics all the way down to um, front-end standards, we cutter. So this will be, I think, mostly the, um, I'm going to show some demo every now and then and uh, I will walk you through um, some of the uh, technical aspects of it. So the skyscraper story. How it all began. So um, it's we have a um, this is our CEO. So it's, it started as a just a, a very simple uh, spreadsheet where uh, because he he liked to they liked he and his brother liked to ski around Europe and uh, at that time on the year two I think about early two thousand it was it was uh, the the advent of uh, budget airlines. There were quite a lot of budget airlines around Europe and they find it hard to compare the prices, so they started with a spreadsheet with the MS Access uh, backend, oh, I mean database uh, growth. So uh, after the, we have founded, they have founded Skyscanner, we have experienced this massive growth along the years where um, I'm going to show this uh, timeline here. Pro probably uh, I'm going to highlight here the, some of the uh, things that exactly happened and, uh, and we can go back to this later and uh, so that I'm going to reference this back because uh, it's going to um, show you some of the problems that we encountered. So uh, 2003, Skyscanner was founded. I'm going to highlight some of the, probably some of the things here, like um, in 2013, when we uh, started to uh, acquire a hotels company, which is uh, called Fog. And then after that, we opened an office in Sofia. And um, around, uh, 20, so early 2015, we also acquired another company, uh, another hotels company, which, uh, so it's another uh, group of people, another team, and um, that, that's one of the reasons why we have a very diverse um, team in Skyscanner. So, so this is uh, the growth that we experienced. I'm going to go back to that later. Um, oops, that's, I don't want to go through that. And uh, our ultimate goal is make travel booking as easy as possible. So uh, 
along that growth that we experienced, we, uh, we ended up with having this distributed teams across, across the region, um, across different countries. So uh, we ended up being a very, let's say, being a global company where um, we have uh, 60, about 60 million visitors and we also have um, all these uh, different employees from um, around the world where it became a bit uh, really challenging to manage at some point. Um, so I'm going to highlight the challenges that we faced uh, when we were uh, during that stage of growth. So when you see this picture, I probably would like to maybe what you can imagine the, the communication uh, problems that we have. Probably we have um, uh, different teams from different countries. So uh, there were different teams that had different standards and uh, we also had, um, we ended up with too many languages and frameworks and there's also duplication of work that uh, has happened. Uh, so these are the engineering challenges that we faced uh, that I mentioned earlier. And yeah, so imagine we, we ended up with a situation like this where we had um, this uh, different teams from different um, regions. They have different stack. We had this, uh, uh, we had some really strange combination of uh, stack, tech stacks. Uh, it's, uh, it's more of a like, result of acquiring different companies and also different people from all over the world. And if you notice, there's, um, there's this uh, Aurelia the logo that you see, which is, um, I just want to highlight that because it's one of the uh, JS frameworks that one of, the, one of our engineers in Singapore proposed. And right now, I don't know what happened to that framework. <laughs> so um, so, so the, the story here is that we were not, we were not ready. So um, because we didn't have the, the proper infrastructure and tooling and also, uh, we've given uh, all the teams too much autonomy in what they're doing. So uh, we ended up just having this uh, diverse set of uh, languages and frameworks. And also, there was um, at that time we were ex also uh, playing around with uh, AWS. We're experimenting with AWS. So we, I think, what we did was that we had um, we just gave everyone a, a, a five hundred dollar budget per month on AWS and gave them the license to every team the license to deploy and, uh, and use AWS. So this is one of the consequences that we need, we need to face. So in order for us to solve that, we need to, first we need to nail the basics, which is, um, I'm going to walk you through uh, in the next few slides, but I'm not going to um, dive exactly on this nailing the basics part because it's mostly, has something to do with our deployment pipeline. So I think this, this alone deserves its, its, own, um, its own talk. 30 minute talk, I think. Um, so in order for us to, uh, to start tackling the problems, we need to nail the basics. I think the, the very first that we need to look into is our continuous delivery pipeline where um, we're using just this open source software. You can look it up, uh, drone.io. Uh, um, it helps you easily build your Docker images and uh, configuration as code. You can easily just um, just paste there the command line scripts that you need to run. And then uh, it's also container native. So if you're using Docker, it's very easy to integrate with Docker. Deployment orchestration. So after you built your, um, the, your uh, app in the deployment pipeline, you, can, we, you need something that will deploy this to across different clusters. Uh, in AWS, for example, if you're using ECS, um, we need something to, to build that, uh, to, to do that. So we have this uh, internal tool that we call Slingshot that allows us to deploy in ECS clusters. I'm not going to uh, dive into that, but I do have some articles here that I, I posted in the reference that you can, uh, you can check. Um, it's a, it's a three-part article that our former CTO wrote that probably can learn a few things on can how to... Uh, stuff on yeah, I'll do that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, then, okay, so after we nail the standards, we need to come up with um, our own um, front end standards that we need to adhere to in order for us to um, 
make sure that the business is running, but at the same time we need to um, also make sure that we adapt to the growth, that uh, the growth rate that's uh, happening. Um, so a part of the front end standards is uh, cookie cutter. Uh, cookie cutter is, um, it allows you to somehow reuse the um, existing templates that are pre-configured and uh, run them as services. Uh, is, anyone, is anyone familiar with cookie cutter? Or they have used cookie cutter, the Python? Uh, no, okay. Uh, I, I will show a bit of a demo later, but uh, we, we kind of um, modified it a little bit to, in order for us to, to reuse it in, in internally. So what, what basically it is, is yeah, you have a set of templates. Uh, maybe I'll just go straight to, the, to this diagram, hopefully it's, which is hopefully clear enough. So you, you just need to run this uh, command line, uh, this, this uh, command on, on your shell, and uh, you just, we just have a, a preset um, template which, which contains the, uh, the configuration that we need to deploy and uh, the existing like, front-end components that are reusable. And then we just ne need to enter the, the details in order for us to, to make sure that um, we, we name our services properly, we know who's the owner. Um, you know what, I'll just show a demo and then, so it's easier. So, here's how it looks like. So we have, um, I'll just, Oh, it's too small. Is this visible enough? Yeah. Okay. So we just we just need to run this uh, a command like this. Uh, for example, you have this uh, template that we already have prepared, and uh, I want let's say I want to build a new um, a new front end or just a new simple web app uh, with the node. I'll just um, run this in my command line. Uh, for example, I then it's going to ask me for certain details or information like, um, Okay, looks like the demo doesn't work. <laughs> Let me try again. I think there might be an error the fact that demo and the whole demo is failed. The what? You've got demo there and demo will just fail by default. <laughs> okay. Uh looks like it's uh it's our lucky day today. So I'll just um, so so the, the idea is that I, I'll just enter this and then it's it's supposed to ask me a few set of um, information like a service name, then the group GitHub group uh, description of the service, and uh, you'll end up with um, you're supposed to end up with this uh, with a service that uh, has all the pre-configured script that we have. Like for example, this one. So maybe I'm connected to the oh okay I don't know why I'm connected to the guest Wi-Fi. I need to connect to our internal Wi-Fi. Okay, I'll try that again. Well, at least at least the the page loaded. Okay, so there you go. Um, yeah, so this this is what it's supposed to ask me. So it's supposed to ask me the name of the microsite. So this is going to be the namespace when you when you deploy your uh, your web app to production. So I'll just name it as. Uh, um, for example, and then it's going to ask me another information, which. which is the description, blah, 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 so I'll just put some description. 
the AWS project. Blah, blah, blah. So that's an example. And then it's going to ask me what's my target user. So if I put their partner, for example, it's going to uh, enable authentication. If I put um, internal, it's going to use to enable the LDAP authentication, for example. I'll just use uh, Traveler. Um, so these are, are, are this is just arbitrary questions. Like for, in, in our case, we have uh, we classify our services into three categories. So if it's first class, it means that it needs 24 hours, 24 seven support, for example. So I'll just, just for testing, I'll just put um, zero here. So after this, it's, uh, it's, supposed, it's right now generating the project in the background and I'm supposed to see this folder right here. And when I come in, you can see that it has all the, everything that you need uh, about um, when you want to run a, a React, a React um, web application, uh, it pre-configures everything for you. And if you go here, you can actually see the, so this is, um, we can re reference this back later, but this is, oh. You can see the, so from here, the, oh, this is not the one. So actually pre-configured pre the, the service name. This is just one example. So there are many other things that it has pre-configured for you. And um, yeah, this this was the this is a service that I um, cookie cut earlier just to make sure that uh, in case in case it fails. Um, but but you get the idea. It's just um, you're just cookie cutting an existing template, and um, anyone can just reuse that same template over and over again. So going back to the slide. Okay, so that was the cookie cutter. Um, then the other standard that we tend to follow is uh, reusable <coughs> React components. Um, luckily, recently React has been quite a, a bit of a game changer for us. I only have uh, 19 minutes left. Okay. Okay. So um, then React components. Right. Cool. Okay. Uh, then. Okay. Reusable React components. So these are just reusable standards. So it, just imagine it's. It's our own version of uh, Bootstrap, where we just go to uh, one location and then we just reuse the same elements, uh, the same buttons with uh, with their own, uh, with exactly the same color, uh, same padding and margin. And so, in the case you haven't seen, we have a. Uh, it's open source. It's um, it's called Backpack. Backpack, and it's on <coughs> GitHub. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll. So this is the um, how it how it looks like. So the entire process. Maybe I'll try to connect it with the cookie cutter. So somebody, for example, going back to the cookie cutter, somebody will cookie cut a template, and then enter the service details in there. And then the next thing is that um, once your uh, web app is ready, we have uh, this uh, reusable React components that we just um, we can copy and paste literally and just install as uh, as just npm install and then copy paste the the element name and set it. So I can show a bit of demo here. Let me go back to my editor. So here I'll just you can tell that uh, I've done this so many times before. Uh, view presentation mode. View presentation mode. Presentation. presentation mode. Okay, gotcha. So here, um, so this is the, an example of um, one of our pages internally. So this is uh, an example of a backpack tag. And then I'll just pre probably just add another uh, backpack tag here and, um, and just deploy it. Uh, save the changes. Exit full screen mode and then just uh, Refresh the page, and I'm supposed to see the the changes that I did just now. There I go. Okay. Yeah. So that's basically our an example of our backpack component. And um, what I normally do is that I'll just go to our documentation page and just copy paste the the elements and the examples here. And 
play from current slide. Okay, that was the demo for our React components, which is uh, which we internally call Backpack. The next one is Open Components. So we have this um, we have um, this tool that we this open source open components. So basically, it's it's uh, it's also a reusable component, but it runs on its own server. So what we do is that we deploy it behind the API gateway in Amazon, and um, it, it's it's just um, it's just another Node React app, but it's um, it's reusable and it, it's hosted and it's dynamic, so you can pass a parameter. Um, so one example is I'm not going to show an I'm going to show an example later, but I'm just going to show you like maybe a, a how it looks like from a high level point of view. So this is, uh, for example, this is your web application right here. Um, you can see the header OC. OC is open components. And then you have the OC registry. This is where all the open components are hosted. So what we do is that our, our web application, uh, skyscanner.net, for example, will consume this from, um, from another server, which is uh, which we, what we call the OC registry. And then doing that, it, it makes it easier for us to, let's say you have a, a separate pipeline for your header, sidebar, footer. And uh, if, if there are changes that you need to do on the header and sidebar, it, it reflects across the different web applications that use it, which, uh, which kind of helps uh, reusability, uh, I mean, helps in reusability and makes it easier for us to um, work together, especially when it's a bigger team. So this is how it looks like in, in the overall workflow. So, just um, uh, cookie cutter, and then after your cookie cut, you have this web application that was done from the cookie cutter, and then you just need to make sure that you call the the open components header and sidebar so so that you can render them. And uh, I think it's best to show another demo for that. Um, so I'm going to show you first how it looks like in my local machine if I'm running a preview of the open component. So this this is an example of open component for our. Uh, when a partner is logged in for our partners, for example, um, Expedia, wh whoever, the uh, on uh, online travel agent or airline. So, so what, the, what our web app does is that it's going to do a get request to this and it's going to somehow inject the, the content part or the, the microsite part in between or in the, in the middle or just somehow do some sort of um, composition and uh, we also have this, uh, this is another example, which, is, which probably looks familiar to some of you who uses the skyscanner.net, who visit it. Uh, let me. Yeah, so this is basically the, another open component that, that just hosted somewhere. So imagine somebody, when somebody makes changes here, it's supposed to reflect across the different verticals, flights, hotels, sky hire, and so many other pages. Um, and what else can I show? And it's it's rendered this way actually. It's uh, rendered in um, a unique way. So so it's very flexible when you render it. So you can render it like this, and then you can set different versions. So your your app is, um, and then this will be consumed by your. Um, maybe you can, it, however you want to use it, you can use probably the, the new async, async function in React, or just as long as you can get and render it, uh, should be fine. So we use this a lot, I think, for mostly A-B testing. So it's easier to maybe switch the different front-end components. So that's the open component demo. And I'm going back to my slide. OK. Um, so this is so. Uh, just now, I showed you the the bits and pieces, starting from the cookie cutter, uh, then the the React components, and then the open components. So this is how it looks like right now. Um, the, the our overall structure from a, another maybe higher level. So we have um, we have this uh, different microsites, and there's a routing service, and these microsites are owned by different different teams. So it's easier for us to just um, uh, to to deploy, and uh, we don't have to worry about um, uh, using the same monolithic code base uh, from different uh, locations, different squads, and um, 
it also makes it easier for us to to switch to another squad because or another team because we're practically just reusing the same components and um, the same standards that we have. Yeah, so the here are the just a few lessons learned that I want to to highlight. Um, so when we're implementing all of these standards, overall it's um, it, it works both ways. So for example, if you're an engineer using it, um, you you need to uh, you need to for example, if you encounter any issues, you need to uh, have this, that patience and report the bug, uh, g um, file the bug reports to the developer enablement team who's working on it. And uh, and also, you also need to uh, instead of having to find a workaround yourself, uh, just you need to be very disciplined enough to um, to hold it off and maybe wait for the fix. So that every, because it's it's kind of a um, um, more of a long-term investment. It, you're going to slow down for a while, but then it's going to speed you up at some point. It will not work for all engineers. So I think one of the lessons we learned was that there, there were um, not a lot of engineers really uh, are okay with this kind of change because most of the really um, CSS-focused or JavaScript-focused work is offloaded to another team who's really doing all that work. So if you're unfortunate to not belong to that team, and then, for example, you, there's um, you, you couldn't join the team because they 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 already have enough people, so it's going to be hard. Uh, so we had a few people who who left because uh, because of this situation because they really want to do some really pure front end stuff. Um, less effort in handing over ownership and team rotation. So this one makes it easier because there's a clear line of what you own and uh, what what services are are you supposed to maintain. And when you uh, switch teams as well, it's it's quite easy for you to just. Hand over all this, uh, all the microsites, the open components, because they're pretty much the same. But uh, but we're, we still have uh, this challenge at the moment because there are still some um, old pages that we haven't migrated yet because uh, due to you know because there's just so many things going on. So for example, if you look at this page, um, the, our flights page, uh, obviously this is already using our latest components. React, React component, the backpack component. This is the standard button. If you go to hotels, you see the same thing as well. It's uh, so it's exactly the same style of button. But when you go to car hire, you can, you'll easily notice the our legacy. Uh, it's one of our kind of neglected um, product at the moment. But <laughs> we're we're um, we need to prioritize. But uh, I think as long as right now it's the business is still running for car hire, so it's okay. But we're uh, we're working on it, and uh, let me see what else. And yeah, um, that's that's it. That's how we, how we do. Uh, how, that's our standards and how we do front end development. Uh, thank you, Adi. Questions? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Cookie cutter, uh, because Re React tab. So React tab is it that React specific? Yeah. Okay. Um, cookie cutter, we use it. It's it's more of a, a general tool that we use, not just for React. So it um, it helps us. It's because for us, it's more flexible. We use cookie cutter for um, our Java services, our Python, iOS, HTTP services, um, and for React. So it's uh, and it's also meant to. Somehow help you templatize the um, some of the um, configuration for your service, like your AWS file, your uh, drone or deployment file, and Docker file. Yeah. Um, so the dynamic loading of JS, right? It's actually still pretty fast, but you're not compiling all of your the the accepted uh, wisdom appears to be that you have to compile your but in the case of this OC registry, mm -hmm. it appears that you load one JS and then multiple JS gets loaded by a dynamically loaded JS station. 
does that doesn't that affect performance? Yeah, there, there's a bit of a trade-off uh, with the convenience that we that there is a trade-off definitely. So you need to do a bunch of HTTP requests for that. But um, but I think nowadays the computing power is cheap, and all these HTTP requests can, especially when you're on the cloud, is quite cheap. So we, we have that, that trade-off that we have to deal with. Um, it slows down a little bit, but uh, it's not very noticeable. Just like just like how, for example, when you search Google Flights, you search Skyscanner, you see how noticeably faster Google Flights is um, because because they have their own like um, GDS. So we also have that um, disadvantage with the, the con because of the convenience that we're trying to, to achieve with open components. Last question. Sure. What exactly is OC registry? Is it a database or is it an S3 bucket from which you can download JSON ah. objects? It's, a, it's actually a, a service that's uh, open source that's being maintained by a company called OpenTable. So if you look up the link that I sent here, so they're a, I think they're, they're a startup that had, had the same problem as us. So they, they found a way to, to um, come up with this open components thing that, where you can just deploy your front end components. Yeah. Why not just put it on the S3 bucket? Uh, because we want it to be dynamic. Uh, so this OC components actually react and node. So you can pass parameters and do some processing in the background, and you can also call another API endpoint. Yeah. I was going to ask about your performance, because I saw like, the lazy loading in JavaScript and your CSS, which is forcing repaints and all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing you just haven't really looked at it all that much yet. Is that not yet? Fair? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's fair okay. to say. Yeah, and uh, also, also because, it's especially for us, who, the the teams who use this uh, tools that we have, um, probably it's it's not a good habit, but we have this habit that we'll just leave it to the developer enablement squads to to uh, figure it out for us, and they'll okay. just reuse whatever they. So you need performance budgets and global performance monitoring. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, email other questions from anyone else? I found a bug, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> just erase it. Yeah. So how, how long did it take this whole process, mm -hmm. like from the point where you realized we need to switch to this thing, and then to how long, did, how long was that? And was there like a core team that was put together to kind of like formulate this whole thing, or mm -hmm. was it more like organically that? Like ah, right. It was a conscious decision. We really came up with the, um, we had a, you're right, we had a core team that, that really started this. So uh, we started with a, what we call a release engineering team who, who we uh, who focused on automating all of these. So it started from 2013, um, maybe late 2013. And then uh, it took us probably a year to really nail the, the deployment pipeline and make sure that, no, uh, maybe you have less five engineers complaining every day just to make sure that it's, uh, it's uh, usable. Uh, How big was that team? So the team that started it, it was it was about seven people actually. I was I was supposed to be initially with the team, but it was hard for us to coordinate because most of them are in Edinburgh. So uh, yeah, I only I only contributed on the command line, like uh, very, not very significant contribution. All right, any last questions? Um. If anyone doesn't know what Skyscanner does, because Skyscanner is one of my favorite things that I'm on all the time, um, anytime you are looking to fly from somewhere to somewhere else, Skyscanner does a search across basically every airline you can think of, um, all sorts of weird route configurations that you've never heard of, um, and carries it across lots of different sites. So they don't sell you the fare themselves, they basically show you other places. Um, and to give you a practical example, say you're organizing a Talk CSS conference in January of this year and had to fly someone, and had to get them here as cheaply as possible. Um, Skyscanner is my go-to for that. Um, so if you don't use it or similar things for when you're planning your holidays, then do. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Thanks for selling the product. <laughs> Next up is Zell, who 